Well, I don't know how many of us have recently been to a New Orleans funeral, <laughs> getting out in the street and praising God as if we had something to celebrate. But I do want to thank our choir, our musicians, our instrumentalists for reminding us that today is a day of celebration. We may read the names and remember these folk with some solemnity and reverence, but we are celebrating that we are a part of something bigger than ourselves. We are celebrating today being a part of that bigger thing and the giftedness of God's presence and love and grace that comes to us and that we are to pass on. Here this passage, this scripture lesson that comes to us from Revelation chapter 21, verses one through five. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See, the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them, and they will be his peoples, and God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more. For the first things have passed away. And the one who is seated on the throne said, See, I am making all things new. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Lord, your servants wait upon you. And we pray that the words we speak the meditations of our hearts would be acceptable in your sight, for you are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. I am indebted for today's sermon to a fellow United Methodist pastor named David Griebner. David served his career and continues to serve in Ohio in that annual conference. And he wrote today's story, we'll call it a parable, as a part of a graduate uh, studies project that became a book. And the title of the book is The Carpenter and the Unbuilder. The Carpenter and the Unbuilder. You can Google it and order it if you like. I think it's still in print. But it's a collection of stories and parables he wrote based on Jesus' teaching and based on the Gospels. And many of them take modern day worship, uh, the church year, high holy days in the life of the church, or themes of Jesus' teaching, and give them a contemporary or modern twist. And so today's story, I think you'll see how it is connected uh, to all saints. It goes like this, once there was a very ordinary young man. As a matter of fact, the only extraordinary thing about this young man was his great aunt. She was truly great in more ways than you and I can imagine. And since this young man had grown up and moved away, he hadn't spent much time with his great aunt. Actually, he hadn't even seen her in many years. We can understand then why he wasn't terribly upset when news of her death came to him. He, he grieved a bit, but he wasn't that close to her. And so he was more thinking of those family members who did know her well and were close to her. But 
He did become more interested when he learned just a few days after her death that she had remembered him in her will. Now, he didn't get overly excited or hope for much money because she had always been a very humble, modest woman living uh, in modest means, far more generous than she was rich. Then again, he thought, one never knew, maybe there were some hidden accounts somewhere or some sources of money and wealth that she never told anybody about. So his fantasies became quite elaborate as the day approached for him to go to the attorney's office for uh, uh, the reading of the will and to, for him to receive what she had left him. He began to imagine that maybe there was something there. And so his hopes were only dashed a little bit when it came time for his name and his part of the will to be given that he was handed a key and a note. The note said that the key was to a room in her apartment, his great aunt's apartment. It said further that if he wanted to, he could go to the apartment and take what was in the room. What in the world could it be, he thought. Didn't take him long to get to the, her apartment. He, he got some help, reminded the way, to, how to get there. and. So he got into the apartment, he found the room, and he turned the key in the lock, and he opened the door, and there in the middle of the room was a single table. And on that table was a pure white pitcher. And beside the pitcher was a note. Other than these three items, the room was completely empty. So he read the note. In this pitcher is the gold of God. You may empty it once a day, and it will always be full the next. But take care, for only one vessel will hold this gold long enough for it to be of any use to you. Well, with growing disappointment and much disbelief and skepticism, he looked inside the pitcher, and sure enough, there was something that looked like liquid, and it looked like it might be golden, uh, kind of moving around in the pitcher as he gently uh, held it. But the gold of God? I mean, come on. Then again, what could it mean, he asked himself. Could this be some sort of a, a joke or a, 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 a trick that his great aunt was playing on him after her death? Was it a puzzle that could lead him to some real gold or wealth or riches if he could figure it out? He looked around for something to pour the contents of the pitcher into, but there was nothing in that room or in the apartment. Well, she said she could have that she had said that he could have what was in the room if he wanted it. He didn't want the table, so he just took the pitcher and the note and he went back home. Once inside his own house, his own home, he got a glass, a large drinking glass, clear glass, and he took the pitcher and he poured some of the contents into the glass. And sure enough, something gold, at least it appeared to be gold, poured from the pitcher into the glass and filled up the glass. But then suddenly, almost before the pitcher was empty, the liquid, the golden liquid, began to disappear like it just was falling out of a hole in the bottom of the glass. But it wasn't spilling. It was just like magically disappearing, evaporating almost before his eyes. And soon there was nothing left in the glass and nothing left in the pitcher. So it went back, he went back and read the note again. In this pitcher is the gold of God. You may empty it once a day, and it will always be full the next. But take care, there is only one vessel that will hold this gold long enough for it to be of any use to you. Well, he thought to himself, it must mean what it says. 
And so he waited until the next day, and sure enough, the pitcher was full again. This time, he carefully considered what kind of vessel he would use to hold this gold. He tried a big pan from the kitchen, you know, metal to hold metal, he thought. But again, the gold just ebbed away, just disappeared. Over the next few weeks, he tried one container after another. Sometimes he tried containers made of different materials and in different shapes. He even sneaked into church one day and found the communion chalice and tried to pour the gold into that. But the result was always the same. And then he had to wait another day to try again. As time went by, he became obsessed with this pitcher and its contents. At the same time, he wondered what had come over him. After all, it only looked like gold. It never stayed around long enough for anybody to prove what it was, gold or something else. But try as he might, he could not go for a day without trying to pour it into something new or different. One day, as he was pouring the contents of the pitcher into the neck of this very expensive and rare Chinese vase that he had purchased. He spilled some of the gold on his hand. He never thought about what would happen if he got some of that stuff on himself. And as he quickly reached for a, a, a towel to wipe it off, he, he hesitated for a moment and just looked at it. It seemed to stay on his skin a little bit longer than on in any of the other vessels that he had tried. And it gave him kind of a warm, almost a tingly feeling, but it was a good feeling. And then it disappeared, and he, he went over it with a towel, but there was nothing there. The gold had stayed on his hand just a little bit longer than he had been accustomed to, and now it was gone, and even the warmth of it was fading away. He stared at his hand for a long time, and he rubbed the spot where the gold had fallen. Then he got out the note from the room, and he read it one more time. In this picture is the gold of God. You may empty it once a day, and it will always be full the next, but take care. There is only one vessel that will hold this gold long enough for it to be of any use to you. That evening, he pondered the meaning of that note over and over. And sometime in the wee hours of the night, right in the middle of the night, it finally occurred to him what he was going to do. His thoughts should have terrified him, but it didn't. As a matter of fact, he wondered why he hadn't thought of it sooner. The next morning, he took the pitcher, raised it up to his mouth, pressed his lips gently upon the pitcher, its softly turned edge, and he tilted his head back and he drank. When he died many years later, his friends and his family observed that something had changed about him, about his life, about his character, about how he spent his time shortly after his great aunt had died. Others could say only for them that he had shone like the sun and he had lifted their faith on countless occasions. Some people even dared to call him a saint. His great niece, who hadn't seen him in years, simply wondered about the meaning of the key and the note that he left her in his simple will.
Today we celebrate all the saints, those keepers of God's gold, and everything they've done to pass that gold on to us. Yes, we thank God for those who have left our midst physically but remain part of our communion. In so many ways, they're very much with us. So let us give thanks for the gold that God has passed to each of us through them, for those who helped us to see that gold, to claim it, to receive it, and for those who will receive it from us. You see, if today has any meaning at all, it's that we have been given the gold of God. Who do you know who needs it? Amen and amen. <laughs> 